side note of what was going on as Jesus was making his way to the crucifixion. But let me begin by telling you that Barabbas is a picture of the gospel if we've ever seen one. See, when we look at a few texts about Barabbas, Barabbas is mentioned in every single gospel. Now, what exactly was Barabbas guilty of? Well, each text gives us a little bit of a picture that we can bring together to answer that question. In Matthew 27, verse 16, they had a notable prisoner or a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. In uh, Mark 15, and there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them, and that had made an insurrection against Rome, who had committed murder in this insurrection. And Luke 23, who for a certain sedition made in the city and for murder was cast into prison. And then in John 18, 40, we see that Barabbas was noted to have been someone who had taken part in an uprising. And so we put all this together. Let me go ahead and explain. A lot of people want to say that Barabbas was just a thief. Well, the word for thief in that language would be kleptus. And that's where we get the word kleptomaniac. That's nowhere in the text. The right word to use for him is actually lestes, which means bandit. Somebody a part of a group of people, the leader of a gang, if you will, who Barabbas really was. Barabbas was a group of Jews. He was the leader of a group of Jews that would go around fighting against the Romans because the Romans had authority over the Jewish people. And there was a few zealots that would try everything they could to make Rome pay for how they treated the Jews because they were overthrown. Not only were there zealots, but there were also these guys called the Sicaris. And the Sicaris were really interesting guys. These guys were even more extreme than the zealots. The reason why they were called Sicaris is because they would carry what we call Zakars, little daggers within their cloaks. And they would go into large congested groups of people and they would get around a Roman or a Jewish tax collector working for the Roman or a Jewish sympathizer, a Jewish person that sympathized with the Romans. And they would get really close to them and stab them three or four times so quickly no one would notice, put the dagger back in their cloak and then pretend like they were amazed that anybody would kill somebody or hurt somebody. And they would stay and pretend to render aid to the same person that they killed. See, Barabbas was a murderer because he was the leader of the uprising against Rome. And because of that, he had murdered some people in the process. He had stolen from the Romans to fund the insurrection that he was trying to lead. And in many Jewish people's eyes, Barabbas wasn't this horrible thief. Barabbas was a savior. In many Jewish people's eyes, Barabbas wasn't merely somebody that was just a petty criminal. Barabbas was someone that they looked up to, that they enjoyed, that they admired. My goodness. See, I just think about Barabbas. He had probably been caught and then picked up, maybe even put on the back of a horse, handcuffed, tied behind his back, and led by the Romans to the jail where he knew his demise was coming. Could you just imagine the shame and the embarrassment that Barabbas might have felt as he knew his death was coming, as he recognized that he wasn't successful, as he knew he was about to pay for his crime? And I want for you to think about this. Barabbas probably could hear a crowd in the distance as he is in the jail yelling things like, crucify him, bring us Barabbas. Now, Barabbas probably wasn't putting two and two together as to what was going on. But see, I just imagine Barabbas is pacing. He's nervous. He's uncomfortable. See, I talked one day a few years ago with a guy who used to work with death row inmates. And he told me a story. He said that death row inmates, the closer and closer they got to their execution date, they started to do a couple interesting things. Those that knew they were going to be executed by a hanging would start to massage their neck. And they didn't even notice they were doing it. But for hours and hours, as the date got closer and closer to their demise, they would just be seen continuously rubbing their necks as if they could tell, they could feel 
that noose already around them. See, I've heard the same story about people that have knew they were going to be executed by a gas chamber. They would practice holding their breath for minutes and minutes on end, and the guards would hear them gasping for air in their cell as they were preparing in anticipation for what is to come. I've also heard modern day about criminals that knew that they were going to be put to death by lethal injection. What they will do is they will sit there and they will rub their arm where they know the IV is going to be put in as if it is already there. They are preparing, they are feeling, they are in anticipation, they are in angst. And Barabbas knew exactly how he was going to die. He knew the punishment for his wrong, the punishment for his insurrection would be death on a Roman cross. And I just imagine that Barabbas, for days, is standing in his cell, rubbing his hands, rubbing his feet, thinking about how that cold metal is going to feel going through his body, thinking about how the Romans might even have to break his legs if it takes too long so that he will suffocate on his own internal fluids. My goodness, could you just think about the stress that's going through Barabbas' heart and life in this moment? Now, why in the world was Barabbas in jail? That's a really good question because the Romans typically didn't wait to punish somebody for their wrongdoing. It didn't take years like it does today. It could often just take minutes. If you were caught red-handed in the act, you could often just be very quickly ran to a governing official, deemed you guilty, and immediately taken you to the cross where you would die. But not Barabbas. Barabbas, and we know of two other thieves, they were held in prison. Why? Well, I believe this because it was Passover. And I believe that Rome wanted to send a message to all of the Jews. And we know that Jerusalem blew up at that time with so many people coming in. The population exploded, tripled, quadrupled five, six times the average population during Passover. And what the leaders wanted for the Jews to know that came in is do not mess with Rome. And so they're holding these prisoners so that they can have a couple of fresh crucifixions for these Jews to see. So they recognize who's really in charge, who's really in control. But then Barabbas hears his name. Bring us Barabbas. And he hears a Roman soldier start walking down the corridor. We hear the key go in and we see the Roman grabbing Barabbas and dragging him out. But instead of walking to a cross or to a post where he would be whipped, what happens? He stands next to a man that he probably heard of before. He stands next to a man that was blameless that was pure, that was spotless. And as Barabbas stood there, he starts to catch on what is going on. He perhaps could be released, in which he was. I have a feeling that Barabbas didn't just walk away victorious. I don't think that Barabbas walked away jumping and screaming. I don't think Barabbas was yelling and jeering at the crowd when he walked away. I really think he was really confused because he was absolutely guilty. There was no denying his sin. There was no denying the guilt. There was no denying that he deserved punishment, but yet he didn't have to pay it because somebody took his place. See, as we look at the story, as we look at the story of the crucifixion, we can't help but focus a lot on Barabbas. But in the process, we also have to take a moment and we have to look at this question of Pilate. See, Pilate was this governor. He he was seen as the leader in Jerusalem. He was called to keep the peace. He also 
had a couple of things that was a little interesting for him. See, he was a very hard man. He was a tough man. We have records that say, believe it or not, he was actually born a slave, but had risen through the ranks. And he had married a close relative of Caesar, which gave him the opportunity to be in governing power. And see, he was very cold, very calculating this cruel, cruel man. And while he was called to keep the peace in Jerusalem with the Jews, he wasn't doing a very good job. See, he was one of those guys that couldn't help but just kind of poke the bear. He couldn't help it because he wanted to feel like he was the boss. He wanted to feel the power. He wanted for everybody to know that he was king. And when he starts to hear about this man being called king of the Jews, I guarantee you it attack Pilate's pride. He thinks, wait a minute, I'm the king of the Jews. This is my position. This is my authority. And so he brings Jesus in. And there's this moment when he asks Jesus, are you king of the Jews? Now, Jesus could have said yes. And I believe if he would have said yes, Pilate would have immediately started that crucifixion process. But Jesus doesn't. How does he respond? You say that I am. They say that I am. But here's what's going on. Here's, here's what's so intriguing to me. Jesus' humility is seen, counteracted by Pilate's pride. His pride was so apparent. He wants to jab at the Jews. See, one thing he did wrong that kind of got the Jews pretty upset with him already is he stole money from the temple funds to pay for an aqueduct. He also marched into Jerusalem with the banners flowing and with rods, with, with staves that had graven images on them of an eagle. Now, let me just go ahead and tell you, that was a no-no for the Jews. We recognize they were not supposed to have any graven images. And he starts to put these images up around their temple. This was preposterous for them. And then he held numerous executions without trial. And then we even have record in Luke 13, through three, that Pilate slaughtered some Galilean Jews who were worshiping and mingling, and he took their own blood and he mixed it with their sacrifices just to have a good time. You can tell that Pilate was not liked by the Jews. It was contentious, and you can't do things like that without your without that resume being built against you, without those rumors getting out. And what happened is it actually got back to Rome and Pilate knew that he was already on thin ice. He could be removed from his authority at any point because he was not keeping the peace well. So when Jesus is put before him, he really is in this conundrum where he realizes he's on his last leg. He cannot make the wrong decision. He can not make the Jews angry at him again. He cannot have them rise up. He is looking to please the crowd rather than to please Jesus. Does that ever seem familiar in your life? Doesn't often, <laughs> we, we don't give Jesus priority. We give the majority priority. We, we want to get, get a group together and take the consensus. Here, here's what drives me crazy. Can I tell you something that drives me crazy about church world? See, sometimes we want to put too much stock in church government where we all get together and we talk things out and we vote. Which I'm not saying there's not a place for that, but here's what I am saying. Here's where I get bothered. When we never consult the Lord before we get to those meetings. That's what bothers me. I think churches as a whole have these issues to where they're not actually seeking the Lord. They're just, hey, as long as the majority is happy, we're good. Guess what? Can I just go ahead and tell you that in God's eyes, the majority doesn't rule. He rules. Pilate is not ruler. The majority is not ruler. Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And rather than seeking the majority and seeking to please them, we seek to please Jesus. And we don't care what the majority has to say about it. That's what I see when I see scripture. So he's standing before Pilate in Matthew 27, verse 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, are you king of the Jews? Jesus said, you have said so. But when he accused, when he was accused by the chief priest and elders, he gave no answer. He stands humbly, verse 13. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? 
Do, do you not hear all the gossip they say? Do you not hear all the horrible things that they're saying? See, they're saying you want to tear down the temple, Jesus. They're saying that you want to overthrow Rome. They're saying that you want to do all these things. What do you have to say for yourself? Verse 14, he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge. So the governor was greatly amazed. And now things get even more interesting. Verse 15, now at the feast of the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. Now see, this was a custom that we find that they did at Passover where the governor could do this. And it was kind of fitting because at Passover, it's that moment where the Jews were released from Egyptian captivity. They were released and they started their exodus into the promised land. This was a very important, very prominent, very proud time of the year for the Jews. And this was a neat celebration for them to have somebody that was a captive go free, somebody be pardoned. And this is where Pilate starts to think, okay, maybe I can make this work in my benefit. Verse 16, and they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to him, whom do you want me to release for you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. See, the religious people are the one causing the problem. The religious people are the ones that are getting upset. It's the people that were the church people and the leaders within the church, the ones that were causing all the issues for Jesus. And here's what ends up happening. It says that they get envious of him. Why do they get envious? Well, in John chapter six, verses 14 through 15, it says this. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is come into the world. Jesus, and hear this, this is intriguing. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So Jesus knows that they want to make him king. They do want him to overthrow the government. They do want for him to be the leader because they don't like the Romans. And that's not what Jesus came to do. So Jesus retreats from that, but he has such a big following that all of the religious leaders get upset. See, back in the day, the rabbis, the man, they, they were seen as the athletes. They were seen as the celebrities. They were the ones that everybody looked up to, everyone respected. And then Jesus comes in and doesn't do things their way. He didn't go to their schools. He didn't cheer for their teams. He didn't grow up hanging out with all of the rich and wealthy and smart people. That wasn't who Jesus was. Jesus was humble, unlike all of the religious people. Jesus recognized who he was, but yet chose to remain humble. They get so upset that they want Barabbas. Why do they want Barabbas? Because Barabbas was the leader that they desired. They were looking for a leader that was going to challenge the Romans. They were looking for a leader that was going to go out and cause mayhem. They were looking for a leader that would be bloodthirsty. And that's who Barabbas was. Barabbas took the bull by his horns and was exactly who they wanted. But Jesus, the donkey riding hillbilly preacher. See, they, they thought they wanted somebody a little bit tougher than him. They thought Barabbas was a little bit more their style. But Jesus was who they needed. See, Jesus was uncontrollable. Jesus was completely uncontrollable and unpredictable. For somebody to say that they loved the Lord, for somebody to say that they cared about the heavenly father, but to do what Jesus did was completely unbelievable to the religious leader. See, Jesus would do crazy things that just broke all their rules. He would go home with a tax collector and eat with him. He would walk through Samaria and spend time with a Samaritan woman who had five husbands and drink from her well and spend time and show kindness to a lady like that. Absolutely unheard of. Absolutely seen as unacceptable. Jesus stepped in the way of another death that was going to happen when a woman was dragged, dragged naked from an adulterous encounter and she sat before Jesus and people were about to stone her. Jesus got in the way and stopped it. Jesus did not follow their rules. Jesus did not follow their traditions. Jesus was doing the will of the Father. 
but they couldn't get a hold of it. See, how do you control a man who looks to a blind man and says, see? How do you stop a man who can look at a leper and touch him and make him clean? How can you control a man who says to a person with a horrible disease to be well and they are well? How do you stop a man who says to a person that has been dead for four days to rise up and walk and he does it? You cannot control that man. You cannot manipulate that Savior. And they just wanted to do what we want to do in our own daily life. They just wanted to make Jesus conform into the box in which they were comfortable. They wanted to make Jesus conform into the box that was easy, that made sense. They, want, they wanted this Jesus that liked everything that they liked, disliked everything that they disliked. They wanted this Jesus that gave them permission to live their life the way that they so desired. Sounds a little familiar. See, the savior that did all that for them was Barabbas. Barabbas was the one that they could control. Barabbas was the one that they could manipulate. Barabbas was the one that was already doing what they liked. But they have this Jesus that's living the perfect, sinless life and causing, calling them to do the same calling them not to hate the Romans, but to love the Romans, not just to love the Romans, but to even serve the Romans. Jesus came not just to die for the Jews, but to die as a ransom for many. He came so that people from all walks of life, all people groups, no matter their past, no matter what the religious leaders would deem them, he died for everyone. And because of that, it frustrates them. It makes them angry. He is not fitting into their box like Barabbas does. Verse 19. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife, Pilate's wife, sent word to Pilate. Have nothing to do with that righteous man. For I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd. You hear this? They manipulate the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they say, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, and that what shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? And they all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. They wanted him dead. They wanted their way. See, when I, I, I look at this text and Pilate, he, he's going, listen, I recognize that Barabbas, you like him because of how he treats the Romans, but he's guilty. He actually did break the rules. He deserves death and punishment because he knew before he ever did the wrong where his decisions would lead him. He knew the wages of his sin was death. But Jesus hasn't done anything wrong. Why would you want for a man who was blameless to be hurt? Why would you want for a man that is sinless? I get you might not like him, but to wish the punishment that we will give to him? Why in the world would you do that? See, little known fact is that the Jews were not allowed to kill anybody at that time. They weren't allowed to take justice into their own hands. The only way they could kill Jesus is through the Romans. The Romans were in charge. The Romans had the power. The Jews didn't have the power to kill Jesus. So they had to manipulate Pilate. So in turn, Pilate does everything he can, but nothing is working. Verse 24. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. There are legends that have gone on for years. Who knows if they are true or not? But after this, it says that Pilate moved out of town and he was seen washing his hands every single day. Verse 25. And all the people answered, his blood will be on us and our children. Pilate, it's not your fault. We will take the blame. Verse 26. Then he released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. See, there's a few things in common that we have with Barabbas. Barabbas had a lot of potential. When we look at Barabbas' name, it breaks down into two. 
Bar and Abbas. Bar and Abba. See, Bar means son of. Abba means father. H- have you ever seen in scripture Simon Bar Jonah? Bar Timaeus? Anytime they use the word Bar, it's to tell you the son of. And we know that Abba means Abba Father, son of the father. There's a whole lot of speculation as to what exactly that meant. Did that mean son of a rabbi? Did that mean son of the heavenly father? Did that mean the pride and joy of an earthly father? There's a whole lot of guesses here. Here's what I will say. Barabbas had a lot of potential at one point. Barabbas was loved. Barabbas was cared about. But you wanna know something funny? Barabbas was only half of his name. See, this is where it gets interesting. I found this out the other day. See, just like Simon Barjona, Barabbas had a first name, and that was Yeshua, which translates to Jesus. His literal name was Jesus, son of the father. That was Barabbas' name. Do you not find it interesting that as he's standing there in shackles, he hears people scream, crucify Jesus. What if he heard that from his cell? We know he was getting worked up. We know he was scared. We knew that he was thinking that cross is his. His death is imminent. It is coming. But then... What else do we see about Barabbas? He was a lawbreaker. There's no denying he was guilty. Romans 3.23, all have sinned. We have all broken God's law. We are Barabbas. And not only was he a lawbreaker, but he deserved punishment. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Barabbas deserved punishment, but Barabbas was set free and Jesus died in his stead. Jesus was not a lawbreaker. Jesus did not deserve punishment. Jesus did not need to go to the cross because of his sin. John 18, 38, I find no fault in him. Jesus did not deserve the punishment. Yet Barabbas was set free and Jesus was crucified. This was the swap heard around the world. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, for our sake, God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. It was the substitute. See, little funny thing about Jesus. Jesus came to earth so humbly, he never owned anything. He borrowed everything. He borrowed a stable for his birth. He borrowed a manger to sleep in. He borrowed houses to sleep in. He borrowed a boat to preach on, an animal to ride on when he entered Jerusalem. He borrowed a room to meet privately with his friends for the Last Supper. He borrowed a tomb to be buried in because he wasn't going to be using it for long. And he borrowed a cross because that cross really didn't intend to belong to him. That was Barabbas' cross. We serve a gracious Savior. Barabbas is the only man in all of history that can say that Jesus literally took his place for his earthly death. But what we get to scream out is Jesus took our place. We are Barabbas. When we look at the story, where do you fall? We are Barabbas because Jesus took our place. See, in Jewish time, there was this day of atonement. And there was this cool moment where they would take two goats for sacrifice. And they would lay the sin figuratively on the goats. And one goat would be slaughtered and then the other goat was the scapegoat. And he would be allowed to go free. He would be allowed to be cast out and go into the wilderness. And as a Loose illustration, that's a picture of Barabbas. Barabbas goes free 
as the sacrifice gave his life. Barabbas lived only because Christ died. See, those were his nails. That was his shame. That was his sin. That was his scourging. That was his pain. That was his death. That was his cross. That was his blood. But really, truly, those were your nails. That was your sin. That was our shame. That was our pain. That was our crown of thorns. That was our cross. And Jesus took our place. We look at the scene. We look at this moment as Barabbas is standing up next to Jesus. And Jesus doesn't say a word as the crowd calls for Barabbas to walk free. Barabbas walks away a free man, undeserving. The chains get taken off of Barabbas and put onto Jesus. The cross lifted off of the shoulders of Barabbas and placed on Jesus. He who knew no sin became sin so that we could go free. Now think about this for a moment. What about if Barabbas refused the gift? What if Barabbas stood up there and said, no, I can get myself out of this mess. I can figure it out. I can get myself out of these chains. I got myself into it. I can get myself out of it. You guys just wait and watch. I am capable enough to rescue myself. I don't need help from anyone or anybody. That would be foolish. But can I tell you, there's so many people in this room that are living that life. You're walking around trying to do life without Jesus. We have Christians in this room that are holding on to your shame. You're holding on to your stress. You're holding on to your anxiety. You're holding on to your pain and your grief and your guilt. And Jesus says, give me your shame, son. Give me your pain. Give it over because you were never intended to have it. And if you'll give it to me, I will walk it to the cross and I will put it to death. But he cannot take it until you give it. He wants you to surrender. And we have people in this room today, I recognize, desperately need to give their lives to Jesus today. We have people in this room today that have been Christians for years, but you have been holding on to your shame and your pain and your stress. You've been holding on to control and you were never intended to. And Jesus is standing up there going, I'm gonna let you go free. Don't fight it, don't argue it, recognize the gift it is and hand me your sin, hand me control, hand me your stress. And I'll do with it what only I can do. Church, listen, in a moment, we're gonna open up this altar. You might need to come down and just get on your knees and pray that God will allow you to release that control. You might need to come talk to me or brother Jeremy. But listen, don't leave this room without being 110% committed and 110% sure that Jesus is Lord of your life and you are in good standing with that father. He did it, why? Because he loved you. You wanna know the secret? Jesus wanted Barabbas to go free. Because in order for Barabbas to be treated like Jesus, Jesus had to be treated like Barabbas. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to look in your word today. God, we thank you for the opportunity we have to make much of what Jesus does for us. And God, I thank you so much that we serve a Jesus that stands on the platform and says, I will take your place. I will take your sin. I will take your pain. I will take your shame. You were never intended to carry it. Give it to me. Lord, we thank you for your love. 